stupid as it may seem, above any other real issue that I may have had, like a physical, tangible problem, I can actually confidently say that hair loss has been the biggest negative impact to my life for so many reasons. And I can't go in depth on all of them, but it actually caused me to develop some mental health issues, like I was saying, due to those unhealthy and uh, obsessive sort of thinking patterns and behaviors that I that I was going through. Um, and it actually ended up sort of baking into the other parts of my life. And to be honest, I feel like I was... So yeah, no, thanks for giving me the uh, opportunity to share my story. And um, I also wanted as well, first thing is to shout out your YouTube because there isn't much hair loss content out there. And like, as also, I think like a fellow hair loss nerd, I'm just grateful for all the work you're putting in. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and, thanks. And also, I, I do like this this new sort of format of this like interview podcast style. I think it'd be like a a good mix of inf information and entertainment. And I really think that um, it'll be a lot of, it'll be really beneficial to people to hear sort of discussing uh, what we're doing in our experiences rather than just like research behind treatments and what, like that's the main sort of content that we usually see on YouTube. So um, yeah. So yeah, thanks for having me. So right now, I, actually, let me, let me start by saying my BAS classification um, before treatment is, I would say M3, V2, F2, if you probably put up a visual of what that sort of looks like, maybe F2 and a half. So that's essentially like a Norwood 4, probably. Um, and I only started about three months, it was actually three months ago on the day, actually, where I took my first progress photo. And now I'm probably, so I was M3, V2, two and a half. Now I'm probably M2, V2, F1 and a half. So pretty significant improvement already. And yeah, I'll give you photos to, um, to pepper in so you can see what the difference is yeah so I'll, I'll i guess i'll just get straight into my story because it's a pretty personal journey for me and I, it might sound stupid but hair loss has probably been one of the biggest impacts to my life in terms of my mental health and self-esteem and i'll and i'll get onto it later but um it was it was probably around 2015 or 2016 is when i first started noticing hair loss and at the time I think I was just scared to talk about it and it was like a bit stigmatized and even finasteride and all the all the treatments were also stigmatized as well I think you know if you go back to the forums back then when I was reading up on those treatments it was finasteride got trashed and it was basically a lot of misinformation and and you know I was genuinely scared to start because I thought that I would lose my I guess my virility as a man <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot of that. Yes, yeah, and especially even you know more so today with social media, it's becoming very rampant. Yep. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of yeah, exactly. Information spreads really quickly, and um, yeah, it just depends on what sort of really can be pretty unfortunate because you can sort of just stumble into the wrong uh, community off the bat without seeing <laughs> one that's a bit more objective about things. Um, so yeah, there's there's that. Uh, but yeah, I guess as well, this also kind of segues as well. So I think um, the Discord server that you have as well, not many people have that sort of platform and that community. No, it's it's really good. And, and I think I would also encourage other people to sort of join if you're feeling worried or anything like that. Because I think like, so we actually, there's there's a lot on there that's it's not just talking about experiences. We also talk about stacks, sharing research and some other off topic stuff as well. So yeah, exactly. you know, it's a really positive community there. Yeah, it's really good. So if anyone anyone is thinking about it, definitely join. So I have three brothers. My eldest brother is he was a Norwood six by twenty four. So, oh three. no. So yeah, yeah. Same over here, yeah. actually. My older brother by twenty four around Norwood five to six. Yeah, around that level. And so you would have seen that at a younger age, being like, "What the heck?" Yeah, it's like yeah. a really stark you know realization like okay this could be you next so that yeah that prompted me to you know be urgent and look up like research about finasteride yeah no me too yeah 100 percent. and i just remember there was a couple of times where uh, we have a set of clippers at home and i would shave his head and i just remember that one time i was shaving his head and he must have lost at least 
50% or 70% of his density because I'm shaving and there's barely anything there. And I was, I was freaking out. I was like, what the heck is going on? And he's like, I don't know. And he didn't really care enough to, to do anything about it. But yeah, it was, it was really sort of worrying at the time saying that. But um, I've got another older brother who's only one year younger than him and he's an old one. So no signs of, of hair loss, probably just starting to show anything. So it's just funny how, how, you know, if you have, if you have the gene, yeah, you just don't know what's going to happen sort of thing. I'm not sure if he actually has any, any hair loss. I'm kind of seeing maybe some crown thinning, but I think his hair is just a little bit thin to begin with. So, mm -hmm. so he probably doesn't have it. Uh, so I'm 27 and it was a Norwood three by 25. And then, yeah, probably Norwood four-ish or whatever the bass classification I gave at 27 now. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, I've got one more brother who's younger than me. He's in Norwood. He's in Norwood two by 24. So he's starting to show the same signs of hair loss that I have, but at a slower rate, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot slower, but I've been, I've been trying to get him on finasteride, but I think He's just coping and he's just saying that he's not gonna he's not gonna take it and he, he doesn't care if he goes bald, but I think he does. So he he'll he'll get on that. I've just gotta wear him down a bit. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's always easy to say that when you're in the beginning stages of the uh, mm -hmm. of the loss. Absolutely, yeah. Hundred percent. And you always think that there's other ways to go about treating it without a medical intervention. That's another thing that always it's a typical thing that holds people back and only just leads to more hair loss and more time wasted. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was 19, that's when I first noticed my hair loss. It was 2015 or 2016, I think. And um, I've got a really good eye for detail. So I actually noticed it really, really early. And this is why it's, <laughs> this is why it really irks me that um, I didn't do anything before the damage was done. Again, sort of falling into that category, I'll kind of get into that. So I had, um, I noticed that not only was, it was sort of thinning everywhere because one of my friends, I just remember this one burning memory is that I was in the sun and he said he could see straight through my hair onto my scalp. And yeah, that, I remember that one cut me real deep. I was like, what is going on? Then I, then I started to notice it. I saw that my hairline was receding a bit and also my hair was changing color as well. It was like, at first it was like a dark brown. I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen this, but for me personally, I, my hair was dark brown and then it started turning lighter. And now starting with minoxidil, it's pretty much gone straight to dark brown again. It's almost like black now. It's really weird. Yeah, that's typically what happens, right? Like when your, your hair is thinning or miniaturizing rather, it starts to lose some sort of its original pigmentation because mm -hmm. the literal shafts itself become like narrower. So yeah, that's, it's always, you know, that, that sort of prognosis, like, okay, the hair color is changing. The texture is changing. I can see through my hair a bit more. That's always like yep. red flags that people should be, you know, be aware of, right? Like your hair feels different in the wind. It feels different when you put water in it. It looks different when you, you know, when you wash your hair out, excessive amounts of shedding with no signs of like real regrowth afterwards. That's always yep. like, hey, you're losing your hair. You better start treatment before, you know, some, some of it is like permanent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I remember hearing on the, the hair loss show, they were saying that your hair quality goes before the number of hairs decrease. So you can have hair loss without, so you can notice hair loss before you actually start losing hair. Maybe you are losing hair. Maybe it's just miniaturizing, which is what's causing that. But yeah, I was, it was pretty intense for me because I had like a really thick curly hair and uh, the curls started getting flatter. And, and I just remember that one time I just got out of the shower and uh, my hair was just flat and like straight. And I was like, what is going on? I was seeing like 300 hairs in the shower, 100 hairs in my pillow every night. And yeah, it was it was pretty bad. I actually ended up just buzzing it down at one point because I got so I felt so shit about it. Uh, yes, I think I did have a bit of collagen effluvium as well because it did sometimes come back a little bit which is a bit odd as well without treatment it kind of seemed to go through some phases but overall on a downward trend for sure yeah so yeah there's it, this is pretty much when i was i started getting into a really bad 
frame of mind just mentally i was just feeling really paranoid about the hair loss seeing it from my brother and just feeling hopeless and just being so young i was just feeling like i was losing a part of my identity and uh also just want to elaborate a bit more uh for the audience so i can sort of explain how exactly uh, my experience with hair loss made me feel like um as stupid as it may seem above any other real issue that i may have had like a physical tangible problem i can actually confidently say that hair loss has been the biggest negative impact to my life for so many reasons and i can't go in depth on all of them but it actually caused me to develop some mental health issues like i was saying due to those unhealthy and uh, obsessive sort of thinking patterns and behaviors that i that i was going through um and it actually ended up sort of baking into the other parts of my life and to be honest i feel like i was sort of losing my 20s and i felt like i was just feeling sort of hopeless and it became all i could think about for a while and there was so that was why at one point i just had to actually just stop myself and just accept it at some point because i genuinely thought that there was no other option like all the medical options and and transplants and all that that was off the table for me because i just i I wasn't really thinking clearly about it all and i was just yeah scared from everything that i'd heard and i just kept looking things up and i just kept getting more scared so anyways during this time i like thought i was accepting it but i didn't even realize that i had become a resentful towards like life and unjustifiably angry towards anyone that I knew that sort of also pushed me away from the treatments options as well and they thought it's fine it's fine I would be like in my head I'm thinking it's not fine uh, but yeah I just it made me really angry anyway so after losing so much ground that's when one day I stumbled back onto the idea of taking Finn just sort of through accident and you know and I thought to myself well I've got nothing to lose so I've and also I was kind of like I said, I was kind of having those ED issues as well, so I actually just started the treatment. So in parallel with, with this time, it also took me like, I would want to say like a full year of therapy to even realize that um, it was hair loss being the trigger that sort of sparked a lot of other things that I was going through. And I was already an obsessive person, like what I was trying to get at, but um, but the hair loss issue for me was a constant loop that had no end which that's where it led to those other problematic psychological issues so nowadays after you know going through all that and not even sort of realizing that it was hair loss because i kind of just put that to bed i you know didn't even think about it for like three whole years after realizing all this now and now being on treatment what i do is i really try hard not to regret starting the treatment so late i know that's a meme but you know i did know about finn when i was 19 and i knew that it worked in most cases i was just again i was just too scared but anyways the, the point is that i'm a different person now and i know so much more about myself and i can actually forgive my younger self for being scared and and sort of confused about it all even though the solution is pretty straightforward but anyways i'm just I'm more or less just healing from the emotional damage that I caused and I'm much more informed and confident now. And to be honest, I feel like I'm actually just finally free and, you know, this weight off my shoulders, this feeling is just priceless. So when I when I saw that, I'll, I'll show, give you that photo to put on screen with where my hair just looked flat. Yeah. And I knew something was going on. I went to the dermatologist straight away. And again, and at the time... Um, unfortunately, I probably got a bad dermatologist because he actually uh, sort of took put me off going on finasteride. Gave me the exact same crap that I was seeing online about side effects. He he didn't elaborate. He just said that the side effects are nasty, and he would typically only give finasteride to older men, and and he was reluctant. He did give me the option, but I was I was scared. I didn't, I didn't want to do it, and I genuinely felt like there was no options out there and I was I was also skeptical if it was even going to work and I thought to myself my hair loss is so rapid it's probably not going to do anything anyways which is another fallacy as well of the treatment because it doesn't really work like that I mean if your hair loss is super super rapid I have seen people that 
if if someone's destined to go Norwood six by like twenty years old, I mean, sometimes the treatments only work to just slow it down a bit, and they don't actually halt it for long enough or reverse yeah. any damage. But um, yeah, so I was, I had a, I think this is kind of this issue kind of taught me a lot about myself over the years and and sort of like how i can sort of work on things so that's so like in in it taking a positive way like i kind of like focus on self-improvement and this is sort of i'll sort of get into when i started treatment and how that actually came about but um i'm i'm a pretty extreme all or nothing person and sometimes like i know i'm also health conscious too but sometimes it's in a really weird way so i find that i swing too far on the side of things I'll be in all or nothing. So either I'm not doing treatment or I'm doing all the treatment. And um and the only time that I feel like I I need to sort of stop myself from falling into those patterns of behavior is if it's doing more harm than good, then I'll actually try to take a more balanced approach. Otherwise it's it's fine. And actually sometimes it can be a benefit because I can be really thorough with doing things. So that's why I started learning all about this. So I was still, I was learning all about how to deal with hair loss, but I was actually, the unhealthy part was I was doing nothing about it. And I just kept, I just remember during uni, I was stuck in this repetitive cycle of stress, exams, running my hands through my hair, seeing my hair fall into my homework, thinking about hair loss, seeing it in the shower, on my pillow, whatever. Um, and just, it get, it, and, and it sort of just built up to every time I would do these behaviors, I would have this anxious response and I would get like really sick in my stomach. And um, yeah, like that's the scary part about it. I think it was just really, I didn't even understand that what I was doing at the time was unhealthy from a mental standpoint and, um, and not having the, the ability to talk to any, I felt like pretty isolated with it. I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about it, not my family or even apparently the doctors didn't really, you know, the dermatologist at the time didn't really care. And I was too impressionable to take a second opinion about it. But um, that lasted for about two years. And then I started to do some counterproductive and counterintuitive things to myself. Like I was, I started um, doing things against my health where probably because I think I'd gone around in so many, in circles so many times that things weren't making much sense to me anymore. And so um, long story short, I kind of learned to, I think I tried to accept it. And Mm -hmm. I guess it kind of worked out in some sense because I don't have, my head shape isn't actually that bad. I can actually pull off the bold look, especially since I've got a nice full beard as well. But, uh, but it got to a point where like I was, I was trimming my hair with the razor, with the, I was buzz cutting myself with the clippers and every six months i would have to drop the clipper guard lower and lower because i couldn't pull it off because the hair density wasn't there and it was becoming more and more obvious anyway i got to a point where i was using the bare clippers and and i thought you know what i'll just go i'll I'll use the foil clipper and i'll go all the way to skin skin fade like skin bold pretty much and um when i looked at myself i thought i can't do this and i was pretty close to needing to do that because the density that I had over the past, it was it was like over one year, went from yeah that Norwood three to like a Norwood four or something like that, where I was diffused all over and yeah, I couldn't grow it out at all. It was it was really bad. And actually, there was that moment where I where I thought I'm going to do something about it. And there was one also one other moment where I kind of accidentally stumbled back into looking at hair loss. So after accepting the hair loss for another so probably what four years or something like that Mm -hmm. i actually wanted to thicken up my beard with minoxidil and that's when i stumbled back onto all the hair loss stuff because i thought to myself oh if i'm putting minoxidil in my beard i may as well put it in my hair yeah and i'm like (laughs) it's it was a funny thing going going full circle like that and and then sort of looking back into things but from a more mature and objective way and that's when i stumbled across your content um and a few others on YouTube and, and just looking again, looking at things on Reddit, but seeing how the landscape changed and that people are a lot more open to these treatment options. And I thought, okay, well, 
may as well start with finasteride. So I did that for a couple of weeks. I, I weaned myself onto it. And this is sort of getting to my stack now. Um, I was doing I, I was doing oral finasteride one milligram every other day for two weeks, and then I went to every day for one week. So mm-hmm. not too long, but that's when I went to the dermatologist and I got myself dutasteride prescribed, and that's when I took my first. Program. Just just real quick, when it comes to dutasteride, how hard was it for you to actually get the dutasteride? Because I've talked to other people, and even you know my experience myself, um, it was pretty hard to pr- procure the you know prescription of dutasteride. I had to use a online telehealth service called Strut to get my dutasteride. But in person, you know, dermatologists were just like, "Yeah, we don't do that here." So, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I've heard a lot about that. Yeah. So for me, what I pretty much did is exactly what I told you. I gave that whole backstory to the dermatologist and I told him about how I was messed around with and also how what how my hair loss makes me feel and and what it actually did to me sort of mentally and and I think he was he was reluctant as well but uh, when I said <laughs> when I said I just want to throw the kitchen sink at it he said okay look he actually he actually stepped out of the room <laughs> went to a senior yeah, I could. The funny thing is, I could actually hear him in the next room talking with the other guy, with the more senior dermatologist, and they were talking about what the protocol should be, how to how to wean myself onto it, and what I should do. Because he was, he suggest he suggested straight away just stop with finasteride, go on to dutasteride. And I said, okay, um, is there going to be any issues with that? That's when he stepped out of the room, and I could hear him talking. And basically, what he came to was this transition period of every three weeks, you increase your dutasteride by one dose and you take out the and you take out one finasteride dose yeah i think that's yeah and i know that's something that we talk about now i don't think it's the most it's probably not the most optimal way to do it but um regardless i, mean, I did that but i yeah so you know sorry i was just gonna jump in real quick from it's, it's funny that you bring that up that that dermatologist you know went about the i guess the transitional period like that because i've seen in you know some of my research as well that it seems as if you would need some sort of transitionary like period what that period would look like whether it's you know just one week you're on finasteride and the next you just add like one sorry 0.5 milligram detasteride and then from there you progressively just add one more every week whether it's like that or whether you you know you just do half and half or you take both finasteride one milligram or 0.5 milligram to test right a day to me it seems like you do need some sort of transitionary like period just for your hair follicles to kind of you know get used to it because the the time it takes for dutasteride to actually take in take effect could vary between people between one to three months just mm-hmm. to build that sort of steady state that's steady presence in the uh presence in the in the bloodstream mm-hmm. and if you're just dropping finasteride just like that you know, finasteride has just, I think, maybe five to seven days, five alpha reductase enzymes come back online, and then your DHT can start going up from there. So the time it takes for dutasteride to start to start working, and the time from the point where you drop finasteride, your DHT levels could be going back up, and that theoretically could have an impact on your hair follicles. So, you know, I, I was very interested in that sort of like, how do you transition people to dutasteride? Or what is a sort of effective way of doing that? And, you know, various dermatologists, you know, they have their own protocols. So it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive, you know, like sort of, I don't know how to say, like just methodology to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think as well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of an individualized thing as well, depending on what the person's willing to do. I mean, for me, the, I kind of want to backtrack a bit. The reason why I was saying it's probably not the most optimal thing for me is because I had just gotten on, I had only had one week of taking finasteride one milligram daily. And then I thought, well, it was only really one week. What I really could have done was go into detasteride a bit more hard and drop the finasteride a little bit and just like maybe like two, go back to two, three times a, a week on the finasteride, but go like three, four times a week on the detasteride. That's what I, I that's, that's, that's my thinking behind it to, yeah, to build up that sort of steady state. Um, and also, I think as well, in general, if someone's being on finasteride for a while, I don't see, unless unless they really want to get on to tasteride, if, if finasteride's not really 
doing it for them. Yeah, I don't see the reason why they should transition all the way to just a test ride. They can have that combination sort of therapy that you spoke about. So I think maybe like even one to two times a week over a three month or six month period, you'll start to hit that steady state. Um, yeah. Which is, yeah, which is, which is probably most, it's probably good enough for most people. Yeah. Again, you get that diminishing returns with, with a test ride. So you're not really going to see unless, yeah, unless you're losing ground and you're, you're just, if you're just trying to see more regrowth, you know, it's, we don't, we don't really know a hundred percent what it's going to, how you're going to interact with it. So I think keeping finasteride in it, uh, if it's doing the job, keeping somewhat of a dose in there is still probably important. But um, yeah, I decided to got really impatient with finas- with that transition period. So instead of every three weeks of going up by one detasteride dose, I, I only did it in every two weeks. But when I hit three detasterides per week, the next week I just went straight into the detasteride. And I was a bit cheeky with it. I actually doubled up my prescriptions from the doctor and the dermatologist. So my GP actually gave me detasteride as well as my dermatologist. Mm -hmm. So now I actually do one milligram daily. And I do that like I take one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I don't think it actually makes a difference. You could just take it at the same time, the the 0.5 milligrams. But um, yeah, I do do two doses a day. And I've found that I've been tracking it pretty um, extensively. I think my response to the treatment has been really good. Like... I just remember the first time I put minoxidil or topical minoxidil in my hair. Um, later that day, it just felt like it, it was just stronger. I don't know how to explain it, but mm-hmm. it felt like it was just, it just felt more, there was more strength to it. And granted, there were a lot less hairs, but um, over, over two months is when I started to see like a lot more regrowth. So, so I, that first three weeks of finasteride, I won't really count as part of the. I think that was like a month zero sort of thing, mm-hmm. but it's been three months since then, and I've added in RU five eight eight four one. Just I don't really have the amount of milliliters I'm putting in, but it's five percent, and I'm just covering the the area, um, like the general thinning area, or like the whole scalp. General thinning area, and also on my temples where it's also bold as well and my my thinking is that there's still some androgen activity going on in there and just trying to sort of cover those bases as well and yeah i I haven't seen my hairline has sort of come down and lowered a bit but i haven't seen um there's some people that get like sort of brand new baby hairs all over just like a bold area on their yeah yeah i'm not seeing that but but my hairline is progressively starting to lower. It's almost like it's receding in reverse, like proceeding. Yeah, proceeding hairline, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a proceeding hairline, yeah. But yeah, so I added in stamoxine as well. So at so a month after... Hang on, so let me get my time right. So it was three weeks on fin, then I transitioned to dutasteride in about a month. And then when I transitioned to, into dutasteride, I also added in RU and stamoxidine. And also, a month after that, I added in uh, a couple other things into my routine as well that I think are a bit more speculative, but I think actually help quite a bit. So I added in tretinoin. Mm-hmm. I'm also on oral minoxidil. And also, uh, La- is it La Roche? La- I-, I can't pronounce it, but La Roche uh, B5 Ultra Repair Serum as well. I put that in around three times a week because my thinking is that it repairs your skin barrier and it sort of creates a good scalp environment. And that paired with tretinoin, so the tretinoin helping turn over the skin cells and then you're protecting them with the B5 serum. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like that's actually, that has led to less hair fall for me. I'm not sure if that's, you know, it's again, it's a bit more speculative than the rest of the I mean, I think it generally makes sense. Like people forget that your scalp is still skin and yeah. the things you do that are healthy for your just, you know, your, your general skin health is also good for your, your scalp health, right? So mm-hmm. doing these things that promote, you know, healthy skin cells, you know, good, you know, turnover rate for your, for your cells, that only goes to better the environment in which your hair follicles are growing hair, right? So it, 
could conceivably have some sort of synergistic, you know, effect where you decrease yeah. signs of inflammation. And when you do that, there's less stress on the hair follicles, these, you know, these micro and these mini organs, and then they're able to effectively, you know, grow uninhibited. Absolutely. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned that, like, they're like mini organs. And I think like treating the skin and the scalp and the hair follicles as, well, the follicles as an organization of many, many organs is, is probably the right way to sort of, sort of conceptualize what we're trying to do here. Yeah. By, yeah, by creating that scalp environment where you can get some, you know, regrowth of healthy hair and, and hair thickening back to sort of what it was pre alopecia. Yeah. I would also say that, like, I think in general, though, when we just look at the, the scalp itself, you know, the, the different concentrations of 5 alpha reductase enzymes, there was that one study, I forget the overall title, but it involved checking the different concentrations of type 1 and type 2 5 alpha reductase between men and women and i wish they had like bigger study just so we can mm -hmm. see like okay if someone's just on finasteride right what if that particular person has a higher presence of type 1 5 alpha reductase enzyme and you know they're not seeing as much benefit as they could get because finasteride's primarily type 2 5 alpha reductase but it also does have a little effect on type 1. But a person who has a higher presence of type 1 in the skin and also the hair follicle, possibly, you know, they would benefit by using dutasteride, for example, right? So it's, it's helpful to think of first you treat the scalp, then the hair follicle, because it's within the scalp that you have those interactions between testosterone, 5 alpha reductase, becoming DHT, which will ultimately attack the hair follicles. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting, the whole, the way the androgens work and how, I guess everything about it has actually just become more interesting to me, like learning about even just like the patterns of hair loss, even just seeing like when people go on, I don't know if you wandered this down this sort of part of looking on Reddit, but when you look at people that are on HRT and looking at their hair regrowth, if they're, if they've suffered from AGA and they, they start with HRT, seeing their regrowth and how it looks different, like the pattern of, of hairy growth. Sometimes the corners fill in and becomes like that female pattern because yeah, I'm guessing there's some est estrogen receptors in those fo in those follicles there, which are there for us, but they're so small. They're not like their hair growth cycle is so short that we never see them grow out at all. Yeah, I actually um, just interviewed. Um, I'm sure you've seen them in the Discord. Someone who it, yeah, yeah, they went ahead and used estradiol and some other, I guess, anti, well, like systemic anti-androgen. Um, and by just, you know, just solely looking at their hair, they went from a diffuse Nord 3 back to a Nord 1, full density. Mm -hmm. Because really, you know, they got that benefit of the aromatization of testosterone into estradiol and also just artificially adding more estradiol into their bodies. And estrogens in general, they, they promote the antigen cycle. They actually extend the antigen cycle for hair follicles, right? So pretty much, you know, we're developing, we all start out as women, right? As X. And then it's only when the SRY gene from the Y chromosome turns on, then we become male, right? So we still do have those, I guess you can say, um, female features within our hair follicles, but they're just not expressed at all because we don't have excess amounts of, you know, estrogens, right? So it, when you do see those HRT, I guess you can say those sort of transitions, so to speak, on Reddit and other forums, it's crazy to see how, you know, when you have people who, you know, were living mostly as male for their life, for most of their lives, as soon as they start, not, again, disclaimer, I'm not telling anyone in the audience to go out there and inject themselves with estrogens, but just from a purely um, scientific standpoint, it goes to show that some, like, some of those hairs are still active. They just need the right stimulation. And if Absolutely. we could create some sort of way to kind of target those estrogen receptors uh, in the hair follicles and, you know, sort of make that estrogen blind to the entire part of the body and just mm -hmm. target whatever sort of, maybe it's some sort of selective estrogen modulator or like the yeah. equivalent of a SARM, right? Yeah. But for estrogens, so, if we could some, somehow target that and turn it on, that would possibly be like, for many, that could be a game-changing thing. Like, the feminization solely of your scalp. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd be really cool. It's a, it's, 
theoretically, yeah. I mean, if it if that, something like that could be done, you could even see that being somewhat curative to hair loss. Um, because yeah, I mean, like again, people say that once the hair follicles lost, it's it's died. Um, but we know that it's a case by case basis. There are some I have I have actually I'm. I look online quite a bit and I do look at different cases and try to just understand what the heck's going on. It's just fascinating how everyone has a sort of different response to these treatments. Not everyone gets the same sort of like you can't all go back to a Nord 1. If you're a Nord 6, for example, um, I've seen like people, they regrow hair, but it just becomes somewhat wispy looking. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Yeah, but um, I mean, maybe that's just because it's not 100% impacting your follicles in a like locally where like it, it's, it's like the same thing as finasteride and tasteride it's only inhibiting the dht by x amount like it's not getting rid of it completely and you'd say the same thing for estradiol it's not all getting to your hair follicle i, I bet you could sort of pump that up and um, there would be an amount theoretically where you'd probably regrow all that was lost i, I would imagine but, yeah i would tend to agree yeah hmm. yeah and so I think that covers off my all that I do. Actually, there is one more thing that I've added in to my protocol, and actually, sorry, two more things I've added into my protocol. These are these are mm-hmm. kind of theoretical though. Um, one is pimacrolimus. So tacrolimus in Australia is really really hard to get, and it's yeah. pretty much um, you have to get it compounded, and it's a really big hassle, and it costs a lot of money. So no one's pretty much touching that. Pimacrolimus, on the other hand, is um, fairly common and cheap. And the doctor that I've got, he's been my GP for a long time. And he said, look, this is on you. This is uh, an off-label usage. He's not, he's not seen someone try to use it for scalp inflammation, which is something that I had. I would notice mm-hmm. that my scalp would get hot and cold flushes. And I was getting some yeah, peeling and, and whatever. And, and I use Pimacrolimus very infrequently, maybe once or twice a week. Same with my, with my tretinoin. I only use it a couple times a week, but yeah, it seems to be working. It seems to be working. So that's that's one. The other one is latanoprost, and I've been. Oh yeah, that's a that's a under yeah. A lot of people overlook that, but yeah, prostaglandin analog definitely. Yeah, I think that you'll you'll probably appreciate this. This is something that's it's it's a bit stupid what I'm doing, but it's kind of weird. What I've been trying to do is almost assess the effect of latanoprost by itself and the way i've done that is i'm basically treating myself like a research subject where i've got like a test and control area so the <laughs> test area is my is the left side of my temple where it's the weakest it's quite it's it's thinned out the most there and i've been only applying like five or six drops it's at it's um i think it's 0.01 percent so you can i think you know where i get that from but yeah yeah <laughs> percent and I've only used about five or six drops, and it's been about a month and a half now. And I'm actually seeing my left side that was the weaker side in terms of density has become stronger than the right side, but the hairs are still quite thin. They haven't thickened at all yet. I don't know if they will. There's no guarantees, of course, with any any treatment, but I hope they will. And... Um, and yeah, that'll be an interesting to see maybe in the next over the next six months or one year to see if that left side becomes stronger than the right side. And if it does, I'll just start applying it everywhere. But for now, I'm still I'm still seeing whether or not it actually is having an effect. And yeah, I mean, it's in amongst all the other treatment. I mean, it's it's hard to say whether or not it is just that. But still, it's I think it's it was for me. It feels like it's worth doing because I mean, it's a lot. It's probably not the cheapest thing, and it's a lot harder to get than all the other treatments that I've got. So it's not something that I'll just start doing everywhere. And if it doesn't actually do anything, then um, you know who who knows sort of thing. Yeah. So, so I just decided to test it out like that. And I, what are your thoughts on on what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean that's definitely interesting, right? Like when you look at all the you know theoretical ways in which minoxidil could work there is this sort of prostaglandin theory where it said that minoxidil makes use of prox- like prostaglandins prostaglandins inside of the like the hair follicle and the scalp in order to help promote uh, you know antigen elongation and just general hair growth right 
And we've seen that with, you know, bimatopros, another prostaglandin analog that is used in Latisse for, you know, growing eyelashes. So that independent of just minoxidil seems to have, you know, this sort of prolongation of antigen when it comes to hair follicles. So I only see it as it being synergistic when you combine minoxidil and some sort of prostaglandin analog like, you know, latanoprost, bromatoprost, or even the stronger one, uh, travaprost. No, I've seen, I've seen those. <laughs> yeah, like when you combine these things, and also if you're coming at the other angle of boosting, of, of boosting sulfur transferase enzymatic activity by using something like a topical retinoid, whether it's, you know, aldapalene or trentinoin, that all together, you know, you're boosting sulfur transferase and that boost of sulfur transferase turns minoxidil into its active ingredient that actually grows the hair follicles, the, the hair from the hair follicles, which is minoxidil sulfate. And then minoxidil sulfate is getting more tools to actually prolong the antigen phase by you using latanoprost or some sort of prostaglandin analog to artificially sort of increase the presence of prostaglandins, positive prostaglandins, because we know there are some negative ones that kind of inhibit hair growth. Yeah. But the good ones come with, you know, that, those analogs. So travapros, bimatopros, latanoprost. You mm. introducing these sort of tools that allows monoxidal sulfate to kind of work better, right? So I think I, I, would, I would love to see um, just an all-in-one sort of, you know, topical like mm -hmm. that one day. But I think, you know, there are services like Happy Head and, you know, other online sources as well where you can, you know, probably request a sort of compounding or formulation of it. Yeah, I have seen it online as well with uh, latanoprost, minoxidil, a retinoid, a retinoic acid, I think it was something like that. Yeah, retinoic acid, yeah. Yeah, and uh, even finasteride as well, all in one topical, but it was just egregiously expensive. Not only that, but like also, I feel like, I mean, that's like, okay, that's, that's a pretty, you know, good comprehensive like growth stimulant, aside from mm -hmm. it being exp expensive. Yeah. Your hair could be, or your scalp rather, could really be prone to, you know, irritation. Like you could agitate it a lot. So yeah. there's a point to be made. Maybe starting out with, you know, just a lower concentration of, especially something like the tretinoin, being very careful when you go outside because it does increase the photosensitivity. Even if you apply it on the night before, nobody wants to have you know, sunburn on their scalp. That's, you know, that's bad. You know, you thought inflammation was, was bad. You know, I've talked to people who've gotten sunburn on, on their scalps and it's, and they showed me photos. It's kind of, kind of messed up. Mm. Yeah, I actually had that yeah. as well. Oh man. I, I was tanning a lot. Yeah, you know, I actually regret this last year. I was, I was actually tanning a lot and yeah, I did get burnt. And because I was, yeah, I was shaving my head. I, I did get some scalp burns and, you know, I was, I have a feeling like I was well on the way to looking slick bald because my head is that got that shine to it as well. Oh so yeah, I'm trying the, to, the yeah. sebum. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, it was really bad. I actually, so I wash my hair every day as well because of that because my sebum is overactive. But through all the treatments that I've been using, the pimacrolimus, the, even the B the B five serum, I have this moisturizer that's mattifying that actually has helped quite a lot to um it it supposedly shrinks the what do you call it? Is it is it the sebum? Sebaceous glands? Yeah, sebaceous glands. Yeah, that's right. Sebaceous glands. It's supposed to shrink them. It's it's the LRP brand. It's a mattifying moisturizer. And I use that pretty much every day on my scalp as well. Uh, and yeah, just actually, uh, I know I'm rambling a bit, but going back to what you were saying before, all of these things in combination, I feel like should almost be a first line defense if you're if you've already lost ground if you're a norwood say 1 or 1 1.5 and you've just noticed a bit of temple recession yeah maybe just a bit of you go on your 5ar inhibitor maybe consider minoxidil if you if you uh, want more guarantee for regrowth but um but if you have the more extensive hair loss i feel like um, I don't know why people aren't more willing to um, give other things a go, like the prostaglandin analogs. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot not a lot of people know about that, you know. Yeah, that yeah, it's even true. available, you know, in topical forms. Mm. I'm not. You're in Australia, right? So yeah, that's right. Is isn't there some sort of like anti-advertising kind of thing when it comes to drugs there, or 
Am I wrong? Yeah, no, no, you're right. You can't, you can't advertise anything pretty much. The yeah, so is mm -hmm. over the counter medication that that you can just buy readily. It's not, it's and I think like supplements and stuff like that. But I, so like you know, if it's if it's hay fever season, you'll you'll see like allergy stuff. You see like um like Zyrtec, mm -hmm. uh, the tyrosine being advertised. But like so, even like generic medications that are off patent, right? Like finasteride, that isn't advertised on like TV or anything. No that? way, no. Oh wow! I didn't, even, I didn't even know that was a thing until I found out about about that being. Yeah, uh, I think it was. I, I think when I found out about it, it was when you were sharing those old finasteride and minoxidilides. Uh, and yeah, I saw one that was Australian, and I was like, "Wait, what?" That really tripped me out because I've never seen anything that's. Yeah, so yeah, I was confused too because when I when I watched that, I was like, okay, so maybe back then, the, you know, in Australia, people were allowed to advertise these. Uh, companies were allowed to advertise these, you know, pharmaceutical pharmaceutical medications, but maybe that was just like some sort of marketing scheme for the United States. I have no idea. This is me four years ago on my 30th, but you might have thought it was my 40th. And lucky for you, bro, I got you that doctor's appointment. Talk to your doctor about Propecia, the proven way to treat hair loss. You can get three packs free on your first year. To find out how, text Keep Hair to 515. I really don't. Yeah, usually we follow uh, when it comes to the media. And sometimes even like with these with these drug approval, we kind of follow what America does. So we have our own version of FDA called the TGA, mm -hmm. um, the Therapeutics Goods Administration. I think it's I think it's, that's what it's called. And yeah, we have to have that approved for us, TGA approved for us to use it on labels. So, but they, I I think once it goes through the FDA process, it's a matter of just filing that same application and getting the same approval. So we have. I don't know why, why I was looking at this, but we have Lynn Levy. It was approved, but it was approved like what a couple months after in Australia than what mm -hmm. it was for America. So that's just the process there. But um, yeah, the, the, I find that Australia is pretty inaccessible when it comes to these sort of treatments. But if you go to the right places, you can still get them. So for example, um, I was speaking with a friend and the other day they were talking about their hair loss and what they were doing and this is a female and she was saying that she's she was on bimatoprost and i was oh, surprised wow. i was like how how did they give you that and then she explained and she told me all about it and she understands what it is and and i thought okay well she she hooked me up with that dermatologist contact i think i might actually go get that uh prescribed because then i can actually use it when i'm it will just be less of a hassle with traveling and things like that i will actually be able to prove that it's a prescribed medication not just something i've just put in my luggage that's not prescribed like ru and latanoprost they're not prescribed medications or anything like that so yeah but it, it's and it's also stronger as well it's 0.3 percent so oh wow i'm not sure if that yeah 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 so i'm not sure if that helps but she said that she definitely noticed regrowth on that it's just that it's too small for her she's getting she's getting like a diffuse thinning everywhere i don't i don't know what i'm not going to go into what she thinks she has or what she doesn't have i'm not sure what she's dealing with but she's saying that she's got diffuse hair loss everywhere and and she can't cover all that scalp area with a tiny bottle that they give you because it's it's a for your eyelashes i think right yeah Is it, i think it's latisse or Latisse or yeah, it's Bermatopra, so yeah, brand name Latisse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, I just searched it up. Latisse is Bermatoprost is the So she has the like the eyedropper version of Bermatoprost? Or well, is it just the literal about... Latisse bottle? Uh, she's like I think she was it's it's zero point zero three percent, not zero point three percent. Yeah. Okay. So that's what it is. Yeah, it is Latisse. I'm I'm looking at it now. It's it's zero point zero three percent. I don't know how that translates over there. I'm not sure if 0.01% latanoprost is stronger than 0.03% bimatoprost. I'm not sure what the, the difference is there. I think bimatoprost is slightly stronger than latanoprost, if I'm not mistaken. And travaprost is stronger 
than both of them. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some other ones as well, right? There's, I think it's prostaglandin F2 analogs. I'm not sure if it's the same thing, but I just... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot, yeah. yeah. And they all, like, I think a lot of them are glaucoma or, you know, eye-related yeah. illness drugs. So it's interesting how it grew hair. Or, yeah, definitely. or eyelashes, rather. Yep. Yeah. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, is there anything that you wanted to ask? Actually, before before we do as well, I just wanted to sort of mention the regrowth aspect of it. I think that's yeah. probably important. Too. Yeah, so most definitely. Me, yeah. So for me, I didn't have any shedding, but then again, I really didn't have much hair to shed to begin with, to be honest with you. So um, as soon as I started with everything, I've noticed that it just continuously has gone better. And it, at the two month mark is when I noticed that I regained, I regained a lot of lost ground that I think was probably about one to two years worth of, of damage that sort of seemed to have reversed almost like as if, yeah, like that preceding hairline again, all that stuff. When I look back on photos, my hair is exactly pretty much how it was about one to two years ago, but it's still improving. It just seems, it seems slower for me now, but I know that it's, it's still improving. It's just that because the change was going from zero to having hair, uh, or like going from a little bit of hair to a lot more hair to the point where I can grow it out. That change was more significant than than some more hair coming in and that hair thickening up, but it still is improving. Like under more light, under more light now, I'm I'm seeing less scalp with the same length of hair. It's looking better when I'm when I'm doing my haircuts. I can actually do like a skin fade and and it not looking terrible. Um, when I'm in the shower over over this past week, I realized that. When I was showering and I'm applying my shampoo and conditioner um, and I'm running my fingers into my scalp, I used to feel mostly scalp and some hair, but now I'm feeling like I can barely feel my scalp. It just feels like I'm running it through hair, which is great. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good feeling. Yeah. I've seen um, people, you know, who give that similar description and like trustless and then you see their photos and it's like, oh, I can see why you just had a you know significant amount of regrowth in that particular area so it's always good to like i feel like it's always good to like keep a sort of diary of some kind right like today i touched my hair and it felt like this you do that over like every week for like six months to a year eventually you'll see like okay it felt a bit thicker right like you always want to do it with the a similar condition you don't add any product Um, after a shower maybe or whatever you always want to be consistent with the condition in which you're checking your hair in Mm -hmm. and it's that sort of, you know, objective kind of view, right? That actually lets you know that, okay, you're getting progress, right? Like, I always say, if you want to see, like, the state of your hair, put it in the most, like, unfavorable lighting condition that you mm-hmm. possibly could have, right? So, that's like going into a dark room, you know, turning your camera on flash and taking a picture of your scalp. Yeah, you'll, you'll see more, like, I mean, you should see, like, your, uh, your scalp. It wouldn't be unusual. But in that kind of, like, you know, environment, over time, when you compare the photos, you'll see that, okay, that area is like getting, you know, more, it's, there's more density in that particular area than there was like six months ago. So true. And I'll show you, I'll be sending all these photos for you as well. And I actually do have a shot like that as well. So um, oh, wow. yeah, it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty si- significant and pretty scary when I first did that. That was pre-treatment. And yeah, just the, the amount of space between each follicle is just like and you can see my scalp it's yeah it's pretty alarming but yeah 100 percent agree you can see you can almost probably even count you could probably even like compare exact follicle locations between photos if you get the right angle you're doing that shot in the dark room with the with the flash on you'll be able to see the same follicles and you'll be able to see oh these ones look thicker oh, i'm noticing some regrowth here i'm seeing some like baby hairs come up you'll see you'll see everything Exactly. So definitely, yeah, definitely recommend that as well. Um, so, I just wanted to. I'll just recap. Actually, that's it's funny as well. You mentioned that diary, that log thing. I'm actually, when I've been talking, I've been sort of referring to my own. I've got pretty much exactly that. I've got a log of what what I was doing. I've also got some updates to my um, to my stack. So it says here that when the new year started, I stopped some oxidine. Oh, sorry. It's first of December, I stopped Simoxidine for a month, and now the new year started, I'm back on it. So I've just, it's, mm-hmm. it's important to also add that in as well, because 
comparing between the photos, you might be able to pinpoint what what's going on for you. I mean, maybe maybe not. There's a lot of there is a delayed effect a lot of the time, but I mean, for me, I've noticed things happening pretty instantly. So I noticed that if if there's something that's sort of uh, having an impact, I'll be able to see it pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, so that's that's definitely important too. I would recommend people sort of keeping uh, keeping a log on what their uh, an update on what their stack is and also uh, what they're feeling and what they're seeing. Um, so I'll just I'll run through my stack again and also I'll go through everything because I've got I've got some more stuff I didn't really cover. So I'll just sort of I'll just sort of list it out. So um, it's IU five eight eight four four one five percent once daily. Not really counting the the milliliters. I'm just applying it to the affected area. I dermarol very lightly, maybe once a week, if that, uh, and also to my beard as well. I do oral minoxidil one milligram every day, and that has we in in Australia we get this P seven compound. It's 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 basically compounded with some vitamins. It's not a big deal, but apparently they think it helps. So anyway, so I thought I'd mention that. I'm also using. Five percent topical minoxidil once daily. That's at night. So IU in the morning, minoxidil at night. Stamoxidine as well as the IU in the morning. Five percent once daily. Tretinoin. I'll apply that after or before before I put the minoxidil in. Maybe like ten to twenty minutes before. I'll do that a couple times a week. Not really counting when. Latanoprost, 0.01 percent daily at night on the left temple. This is before I do my my tretinoin. And then for scalp care, I have I have some sort of hair stimulating shampoo and conditioner mix, which I apply five times a week. I um I use Nizoral twice a week, one percent, which is ketoconazole shampoo. I have that B5 serum after I shower, especially when the times where I use nice oral because your hair and your scalp gets really dry. And, yeah, and it, that's horrible. So, yeah. So I found the best way to, to combat that is that B5 serum. I put a bit of that in there and I apply that to my skin and my beard as well because my beard does get, it does react to minoxidil a little, a little bit, even though it's the non-PG version. Uh, so I, I apply that everywhere. Uh, then I moisturize, and I moisturize every day on my scalp after I shower, sometimes twice a day. Um, and then in terms of vitamins, it's, I don't think this is a big deal, but I actually I miss I miss the main thing that I that I take: detasteride one milligram oral daily. I can't believe I missed that on there. Uh, and then in terms of vitamins, I have vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin B complex, fish oil, and magnesium. That's what I mostly take. Magnesium, not for anything, pop, like not for hair related or anything like that. But I've just been really consistent with taking vitamins, and that is my whole stack. And in terms of the future, we will be seeing how this goes for about twelve to eighteen months before deciding on uh, if I need a transplant or not. Which probably do, especially on the hairline and probably on the crown as well, if the crown doesn't thicken up. I'm hoping it does. The hair's there. It's just, it's just thinning. It's just yeah. miniaturized. Um, whereas on the hairline, obviously, there's, it's, there are no hairs along the, like the Norwood one sort of part of the hairline. So, um, like all in all, how long have you been in treatment? Just as a reminder to everyone in the audience. Not long. So the finasteride. I don't know if you can really count this, but it was like three weeks of weaning onto finasteride. But since then, it's been exactly three months of treatment. So what I'll show you is month zero, which is that weird sort of two, three weeks of finasteride. Then month one of treatment, where I started transitioning to detasteride. Month two of treatment, um, which is one month of detasteride. And then month three, which is, that's when I bumped it up to probably, I think that's around when I bumped it up to one milligram. So I've been on one milligram detasteride for about one month only. So it seems to have kicked in pretty quickly. I'm not sure if that's because, again, like more of that being like a health conscious lifestyle where I exercise regularly and eat pretty clean and I sleep very well as well. I'm not sure if that's had an impact to it, but yeah, I've, I've seen some pretty rapid results. And look, I'm, I really am hoping to 
reverse quite a lot of damage and go back to like if I could get to like a Norwood 2 with like some reasonable density to where I can grow my hair out from just medication in like a year or two's time, that'd be fantastic. But in in hair loss, especially once you've lost the hair and you're you're coming back from it, there's no guarantees like what could happen. So I know that at some point I'll be open to getting a transplant. And look, my um another thing that makes it favorable for me as well is the balding area is like I've got a short, I've got a small head, but my donor area is pretty big as well. So I think it's given me a lot. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's given me a lot more confidence that, yeah, I know. I know. And I'm, I'm also really grateful that where my hair loss has started, my, the actual uh, widow's peak point of my hairline hasn't moved at all. Okay. So it hasn't received upwards. It's just the corners that have just kept pushing back. And so that makes it pretty good for me as well, because well, my hairline was pretty low on my head. Like I could probably only fit, I can't even fit four fingers between my eyebrow and where my hairline starts at widow's peak. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, so I know that when I get the, um, if I end up getting that transplant done, I think the results look pretty drastic because right now, yeah, the corners have like pushed back quite a bit and they're look, looking kind of thin. But once I uh, yeah, sort of fill that out and straighten that out with only probably a few thousand grafts to to that and maybe the mid scalp and, and crown i think i should mm-hmm. be back to uh, looking like a norwood one although i don't think i don't think a transplant makes you like you can't get back to a norwood one you just look like you're a norwood one okay. yeah i mean it's always the cosmetic appearance of things right like yeah. the average person isn't going to look at oh wow look you can clearly see that he had single hair single hair follicle oh. grafts in the front of the no like most people just look oh you have hair over there that's cool, mm. right? Like, <laughs> either way, it's like the cosmetic appearance of what you can achieve, right? And then with hairstyling, you know, you can use other products to, you know, gel up your hair, increase density in certain certain areas. Just in general, it's just the cosmetic appearance of things, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's that's all that really matters, to be honest with you. Exactly, that hundred percent, and that's exactly why doing these sort of interviews is what matters to all because. I know that looking at research is very objective and we can say, yes, there's a hierarchy of evidence and anecdotes and opinions rank low on that. But it's not always about that. It's half the time it's about our experience with it as well. It's a very personal thing that that us, that, you know, us men, most men experience and it's, it affects people in different ways. And that's also why I wanted to sort of touch on that when I sort of went through my story, I, I elaborated a little bit about it made me feel and and sort of the negative impact that it had to me and um i also also want to give like take this time to sort of let people know that it's not it's not weak as a man to talk about anything that you're going through that is affecting you mentally and um don't be scared to talk about it and and reach out to a professional for for help if you need to and on a lighter scale if you're if you're feeling a bit worried about it and just want some reassurance, come join the Discord and, you know, everyone's pretty nice, so. Yeah. yeah. I, so. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement, too. Like, mm. if you're going through something, don't think it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a tough guy, you know, I can, mm. I can deal with that. Like, it does help to talk about things, you know, because just even if you don't feel comfortable going to a medical professional, go to someone you can turn to, like a friend, family member, someone you can confine in, right, about... Mm these issues that you, you may be having. It's, uh, it'll make the difference, to be honest. It really, it really will make the difference. 100%. Well, th- I think that's all... I think that's my entire <laughs> hair loss sort of journey. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to sort of speak about my experience and hopefully it helps other people because, yeah, like what you're saying, talk, talk about it. It's not, it's not weak to talk about it. Um, and... You know, before starting treatment, I honestly thought that my, like, I was going to be bald in my 30s. That was just, that was just in my head. And it was a kind of depressing thought, to be honest with you. Like, yeah. like as much as I want to admit that I, like, if it's outside of my control, I shouldn't worry about it. And, and this is happening to me. It's not my choice and whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we do have things we can do about it. And, you know, we get gaslit about these treatments not being effective and not working, but you, you have to try for yourself, really. 
you have to you have to be willing to willing to try and talk to a professional of course again um, but yeah d- um definitely don't don't think that there's no way out because yeah there definitely is i mean like like i said i thought that i was gonna be bold now now when i think about when i'm 30 years old i'm thinking oh that might be one year post transplant i will be an old one by then which is a crazy thought to me like it's, it's like a dream come true really when i think about it because yeah. that's yeah i never even thought that was in the cards for me so it's you know people just become so demoralized with all the you know fear mongering and you know disinformation misinformation that's out there about what you can actually do while you still have hair, right? I've talked to people who have told me that, you know, they they were just told by people, well, nothing can help you, right? And they were at like a Norwood 2, and then after like eight years, they're Norwood 6, and then they realize that, you know, especially with all these advertisements as of late with finasteride and dutasteride here in the United States, uh, it's kind of like, you know, these people were kind of deceived in many ways. And there's a lot of resentment because of it, because it's like, man, you really could have helped yourself, but you know, you just didn't encounter the right set of information to make a balanced and informed decision. And I think with the fear mongering, there's also, I've noticed just a lot of trolling when it comes to what works and doesn't work. You know, there were some people in my server that I kind of had to, you know, prune and just get rid of because I got curious. I found their Reddit accounts and turns out they're like, on tons of anabolic steroids joining trying to say like oh nothing worked for me like yeah but you're you're doing things that are counterintuitive right like you have to be honest and upfront about what you're actually doing and try not to like hide things to you know paint this sort of you know uh like it's futile to even do anything about it right like yeah i know you'll never know if you don't try yeah exactly fell for that trap and that's why i just have that i do have that sort of resentment as well because but it also it also in a way kind of made me rationally think about this problem being that you know a lot of people get deeply affected by it they you know some people get salty and kind of want to send other people on the wrong path and things like that that's also that's why i want to do the exact opposite i you know participate on the discord i inform myself with you know the treatment options and and latest treatment news and I and and I also go on Reddit and try to give people more of a balanced opinion on things because you know people are people are vulnerable online especially when you yeah you consider like people on Reddit I wouldn't say is an accurate representation of the gen pop I think it's a very definitely yeah 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 I think it's like a it's a selection of people and and yeah unfortunately we get we get a lot of people that have some motives that might not be of of our best interest but um yeah actually one more thing i want to touch on as well is is mm-hmm. the exercise part too because i was shedding quite a bit when i increased my exercise intensity and also started dieting as well um i don't use any i've never used any peds or anabolic steroids at all but still training with weights i feel like increases androgen activity i'm not sure if that if that's true or not, but I've found that the periods where I stopped training is when I was my hair loss had slowed down significantly, and periods where I kicked up the training to like say six or seven days a week, very intense stuff, going to failure, especially on leg training, mm-hmm. uh, is when I noticed really significant shedding. And over that past year, where I went from that Norwood three to like being diffused all over, that was when I was uh, doing my peak exercise sort of intensity and yeah i think you can kind of put the two and two together yeah i mean i would say like the extra the amount of the increase in like androgens you get after a workout kind of peaks within like i think i mean it's relative to the amount of weight and the intensity you were going at Mm -hmm. but it does peak around an hour or two after the workout Mm -hmm. but i mean i i i don't know if it's like completely you know, related to say that if you work out and you get an increase in androgen, it's like you're increasing it within a reasonable range, right? Like mm-hmm. it's kind of like saying the, if you sleep better, your testosterone goes up, right? Like you have good sleep, your testosterone can go up. So would you not sleep as well in order yeah, to exactly. prevent higher testosterone levels? It's like you have these things that are within a normal range, right? Yeah. The mar- uh, yeah. Different. 
you, like, you, don't, yeah, you mm-hmm. don't really know how much it affects for you from person to person. I just, based off my experience, that's what I think. For me, mm-hmm. it's what I think. And, I, and again, like I train pretty intensely, like going to failure on pretty much every set that I do. And I'm just trying to like kill myself in the gym. So I think that probably had some sort of an impact. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah, I definitely agree, yeah. you could get some sort of intelligent effluvium. Mm-hmm. It used to be the same way when, you know, I started working out, training until failure kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think now I don't really do that because I do it every now and again, like probably once a month, twice a month, drop down sets on my barbell bench press, which in the beginning when I started working out, that was amazing. It took me from uh, like 135 pounds to, uh, I want to say 225 pounds wow. within three months on the wow. bench press. So I think that's like 102 kilograms, if I'm not mistaken, 225. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that, that definitely has its, you know, utility, but to stress yourself out, especially if you're doing it, going to the gym semi-frequently to always stress yourself out, that's probably not the best thing to do because especially if you lose weight rapidly, that can trigger, if you lose weight, gain weight rapidly, that can trigger telogen effluvium. So it's always something to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. And and for me, I admittedly, yeah, like what I was saying, I'm very, uh, I can, I can be very, uh, I can be very, I can flip a switch and, and sometimes I'll cut and I'll get absolutely shredded and peeled. And then sometimes I'll just go in a bulk right now. I'm, I'm like, I'm not looking so good right now. I'm looking pretty big. Uh, Big muscles and stuff, but absolutely no definition. And like, I think I'll be doing a long cut now. But yeah, that that definitely doesn't help as well. So maybe my older brother does have AGA, just not doing things that would make like I guess speed it up, speed up the process. I think that's what I what I was doing, and that's probably also mm-hmm. why I think the treatments are so effective for me as well, because because it was sped up almost like to an artificial sort of right i'm not sure if that i'm just kind of like theorizing that maybe it was like sped up to a to a rate that wasn't sort of natural and so now that i've taken away all the well most of the negative growth signals and put in some positive ones there's there's a more dramatic effect to it so that's just what i'm theorizing here no like i definitely agree yeah like like just the oh like any pretty much there's a lot of things that can trigger shedding in general like aside from just dht mm-hmm. so it's yeah 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 it's just there's a lot to think about like recently for me i got a gift it was my birthday on the 27th of december and mm-hmm. someone gave me this leave-in conditioner right i put it on my my hair some of it went on my scalp and immediately i had this like this this hot feeling like this heat came to me now i myself i have an allergy to trees, right? Some trees I get allergic reactions to due to the pollen content. In fact, Mm -hmm. when I was 10, I suddenly developed a oral allergy to all fruit. Like fruit, I couldn't even eat it. It It's only recently after, you know, a decade of allergy shots that I can now eat most fruit. But it turns out within that leave-in hair conditioner, there was rosemary inside of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was kind of mad, but just that initial like inflammation I noticed a bunch of hairs, tiny hairs just falling off my scalp. And I was like, okay, this is horrible, right? Like I probably just triggered a telogen effluvium. You know, I'm going to go to the dermatologist, try to get a scalp biopsy done. And just as a side note, when it comes to scalp biopsies, I think it's such a, in my opinion, a crucial thing to do to assess, okay, maybe this person has androgenetic alopecia, but maybe they also have something else. Like if you see high presence of like leukocytes, macrophages and other other sort of signs of inflammation it could be going through like something that's agitating the hair follicles in general which causes even more oxidative stress which makes already dht sensitive hairs just even even weaker to dht right yeah, so yeah. my thinking was like okay i gotta go get a scalp biopsy because i need to know like what's going on so i was really proactive I got hydrocortisone, what is it, hydro, hydrocortisol cream, and I just apply it to my scalp just daily. And after a week, that inflammation, like as the week went on, the inflammation just died down. And right now I feel better, but I'm still going to get that done. But I think like, again, just those small things like an allergy to something within, you know, like everyday hair care product should be taken into account. 
right? Like yeah. it's not just DHT that can mess up your your the quality of your hair. Yeah, I've heard I've heard people who don't have people that don't have androgenetic alopecia. I heard of them uh, swapping out their shampoo or reducing, not using shampoo at all, just washing their hair with water. And um, by their account, that their hair hair quality improved, and maybe that was also hair count. But that's again, this is all. I'm not sure about that, but I, I I definitely agree that we all have different sensitivities to different things. Again, yeah, I'm also allergic. I've got like a just an allergenic rhinitis sort of general allergies. I take cetirizine daily mm -hmm. for it. Uh, and just to yeah, jump in real quick, have you mm -hmm. tried that topically before? <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. So I, <laughs> I was this close to getting a, getting a pill blender and just putting in, getting an entire thing of cetirizine and just yeah. popping each tab in there and just blending it up, putting inside min my minoxidil. I was actually about to do that myself because <laughs> yeah. I have a bunch of it right here. Yeah. 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 It's so it's it's pretty cheap as well, so it's not too bad. But I I think in terms of like future treatments, treatment options, I think that might be one to try i just didn't want to mess with something that appears to be working like everything appears to be working now but yeah i have had that thought so many times especially when i'm i'm taking it daily and i'm looking at it, i'm like this is literally the thing that uh that has been studied a couple times i've you know the studies are pretty weak compared to yeah. minoxidil studies but i mean but it is an antihistamine to some extent yeah so. exactly yeah 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 exactly so you know um there's there's another thing that i wanted to try as well i'm not sure if i I may as well talk about it. Um, topical Tadalafil, which is Cialis. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk about it. Yeah. 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 So Cialis is, I believe it's a vasodilator that, um, let me just, let me just get that right. It's either a vasodilator or vasoconstrictor. And it's, it's meant for, um, uh, for people to treat, um, hypertension, but it's also been used for, um, uh, to increase your, I don't know, would you say like erection quality? It's for ED, yeah. erectile dysfunction. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's something that um, I I just happen to have uh, leftover pills from. I got it prescribed for me, which is actually actually that that might be interesting to talk about as well. Everyone wants to talk about the side effects of, of the sexual side effects of finasteride and tasteride. I was actually having. Um, ED issues before treatment, and then when I started detasteride, when I started finasteride, I was getting the same sort of issues, and maybe I was in my head. But the moment I started detasteride, my my sex drive has gone through the roof, so not an issue anymore at all. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that is the increase in testosterone that you get on detasteride is. It's not gonna make you like you know anabolic, but it is you know, 10 to 25%, I think that's the range. That's pretty mm -hmm. significant. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. No, it definitely works. But, uh, but yeah, so Tadalafil is, there was, what's the other version? The Viagra, what's that called? Uh, what's the activity? I know there's another version. Tadalafil, I think it begins with it. Sildenafil. Sildenafil, yeah. Sildenafil. That's, that's the one that was studied, right? That was yeah. to increase hair count. Um, yeah, again, these are more theoretical, weaker study designs, limited data and all that stuff. But still, I mean, you know, some things are worth a shot. Uh, hey, kitchen sink, you, you know, if you yeah, kitchen <laughs> just want to exactly. hit it hard and then just over time, maybe you drop some things. Then Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. yeah, drop some things, maybe try something else out. And yeah, pretty much just sort of continue it like that. My thinking is, though, like you have to keep the core of the treatment, which is Yep. some sort of 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and yes. maybe a growth stimulant like Absolutely. minoxidil with minoxidil. with tretinoin most, or something like that. Yeah, minoxidil being the most uh, proven and we know how long it sort of works for and what we can do. And Actually, that's a good point. So I'm on one milligram oral minoxidil and it seems to be doing the job. I can, with the dermatologist that I went to, they told me that I can go all the way up to 10 milligrams oral minoxidil. Ooh, uh... which is yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but that being said, I have been on one milligram now for a bit, and if I ever did need to go on ten milligrams, maybe it's some point down the line. And you know, I, I don't imagine it happening. But the point is that 
if it ever stops being effective, I can always bump up that dose. So I've got somewhere to go to. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sort of like just... I would say that it kind yeah. of peaks out for some people, like a specific dose, right? Because everyone, everyone reacts differently when it comes to oral minoxidil. They, you know, some people, even with top, topical minoxidil, you have a, you know, some sort of bell curve of like, you know, people that don't respond, the average responder, and then those hyper responders, you know, all the way at the end of the other side of the bell curve. Yeah. So I would assume it's the same way with oral minoxidil, Maybe. but a lot more people are responders than topical. But maybe with the uh, hyper responding, it could be dose dependent. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Probably individual, right? Some people are more sensitive to it. So that's why they get a hyper response. And then other people, you know, they go to from one milligram oral, fina- sorry, one milligram oral minoxidil to 2.5. And then all of a sudden, like they're having hair all over their body and on yeah, their scalp. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I've definitely noticed more hair on the body and stuff. Actually, in my nose, I've got some more nose hairs that that was the first thing I noticed. Uh, but it was, it's, yeah, I think one milligram. Look, it's, it's not, it's not a huge dose for people that are doing oral minoxidil for hair, but it's, it's probably signif- significant enough that with the topical minoxidil, the tretinoin and, occasional microneedling yeah all those things added together is probably yeah having more more an effect and also i think as well the oral minoxidil the half-life is shorter than topical i'm not sure if that's if that's the case but i remember it being something like oral minoxidil is like a seven hour half-life whereas topical is that 23 hours yeah Correct something like on, that yeah that. yeah yeah so put on the uh you know so i think doing both you sort of getting more out of it um, and that's also actually this reminded me of something that that you mentioned before that the dht spike when you're working out um is one of the reasons why i went on to test ride because of the long half-life i know that i'm constantly going to be sub- inhibiting my 5 alpha reductase enzymes so it doesn't matter when i take it i can work out at any point of the day and i know that my dht won't be spiking yeah, uh, especially when you have that consistent that. presence of dutastride. It's like, I mm-hmm. think even if you stop using dutastride, it will take something like 100 days or something like that for your DHC yeah. to go back to somewhat of a normal or pre-treatment range. So it, mm-hmm. it was a extended, you know, effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's why that's that's why I'm doing, that's why I chose dutastride as well as, of course, it's more you know, you're people, some people are scared about it, but, um, I just thought, well, I didn't really have much to lose. So I'm just going to risk it for the biscuit sort of thing and just throw the kitchen sink at it. And yeah, I think that's for a lot of people that if you're trying to make up lost ground, the kitchen sink can, can be a good option because yeah, you're hitting it from all different angles. So, you know, your hair doesn't really have much choice, but to, to grow. Yeah. I typically see people use the kitchen sink approach when they're either having rapid hair loss, like Norwood 2 one year, the next Norwood mm-hmm. like three, right? Or just yeah, severe yeah. diffuse, you know, thinning, or, you know, they've waited too long over an extended period of time with no treatment. So it's like, yep. when you wait, or, and also related to how severe the hair loss is, is also the same approach you should probably take to address the hair loss, right? Mm-hmm. So true. Yeah. That seems, yeah, no, that's, that's very fair. It's a, it's a measured thing to do rather than you do see some people on Reddit that are like Norwood 1.5 and they're yeah, throwing the kitchen sink at it. And Ugh. that's, yeah, and you get, you get kind of scared, especially when they start talking about adding in stuff like the, um, like estradiol or other things that like bacalutamide and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I've seen that. Yeah. Like, I'm like, first off, dude, you're Norwood one kind of, you know, calm down a bit. Yeah. Also, you know, you should be aware of what happens when you do something to su- suppress testosterone production, right? Mm-hmm. Without any sort of like TRT and you're introducing all these, you know, estrogenic compounds to your body. I, it's, you know, some people unintentionally kind of transition. Yeah. And they and, don't really, yeah. Yeah. You don't really know as well how your, how your body's going to respond to that. Some people will get away with it if they low dose it, but then if you low dose it, you don't know how much hair regrowth you're going to get so it's it's just a risk either way um but yeah you really got to know what you're doing to be able to touch any of that stuff but even if you do you're 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 still probably going to be affecting your um 
your I I guess what would you say your your virility as a man? Yeah, your virility. <laughs> and it could be permanent. We are talking take, yeah. people talk about like uh, finasteride or dutasteride having permanent sides, and it's like, well, you're going to do something like taking estrogen, which mm, really could permanently impact your uh, your production of just testosterone and you know other things as well people don't really get it because they don't understand this is why knowledge is power if you understand how the drugs work you'll know how they're affecting you all all we're talking about here is inhibiting 5ar activity so that we get less testosterone to dht conversion through that pathway then you know that might change your hormonal balance of when you're looking at your profile it's yeah your test goes up a bit some of that aromatizes into estrogen and that increases a little bit this is like what you were saying about getting a good night, good night's sleep, these are so much more marginal than just pumping straight estrogen into your body. That's just you know, you're 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 playing with fire there, and it's just you're guaranteed to get burned at some to some degree. And yeah, you know, it can be permanent sort of impotence and, and things like that, which is um, unfortunate. But people need to be aware of what they're doing. And yeah, you generally when you come across these people, what are they like? Nord one point five or ones, and they're doing this. They this is why we have these classifications because we can objectively look at these things. But these people think that they're a Norwood five when they're looking at themselves. They don't understand. Yeah, but it's that degree of body dysmorphia, right? The moment you yeah, start yeah, seeing a little well. bit going away, that does like y- even people who are more severe, right? Like all this is just you're losing your sense of self, right? That is why yeah. it's are sensitive. That's why it's such a. That's why again, it's a just as much of a mental emotional and mental and social problem like a non-tangible thing than it is an actual tangible thing to your like a physical appearance because it makes you think that you're aging or something's wrong with you or you know and yeah that 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 is damaging and you know where the people want to say but i accept it and i know that it's not that it's like well at the end of the day it's still a condition and and it does affect the way people see you and it does affect the way you see yourself whether you want to admit it or not it's it's real and there's nothing that can really replace having hair on your head you can't really just you know i mean you could wear a hat every every day and actually that's something that i did i had i have bought that many caps over the past three years that i that's another thing that made me realize that you know this is going too far i bought like Mm -hmm. i've got like over 20 caps that i you know just cycle through every day and I stopped wearing I stopped wearing them a lot. I mean, I still wear them sometimes, but when I want to, not because I feel like I'm forced to. And yeah, my partner turns around and goes, "Oh, you're not wearing a hat today." This is like you know when I started training. I'm like, you know what? I actually, you know, I'm uncomfortable with uh, with what's happening with my hair, and you know, it's looking good enough to be presentable. And you know, that's it's a really good feeling. Definitely, yeah. Like I've talked to dudes who are like, man, like I just one day suddenly stopped using hair fibers and I was like, oh, well, that's, mm. that's kind of like how it is. Like over time, you know, you just suddenly start, yeah, at some point you just don't know when, but you look in the mirror one day, it's like, eh, I think, you know, it's a, there's enough hair. So I've talked to mm. dudes who, who've told me that, you know, just in consultations and just general conversations in real life too. When I tell them about like there's treatment, they get on it and then, you know, all of a sudden they just, you know, stop doing things to cover things up because there's, there, I think it's like you're feeling the hair growth too. Like you're clearly feeling the hair growth because it is connected to like literal muscles, like mini muscles in our scalp. Yeah, so yeah. I think you have this sort of instinctual feel like wind blows through your hair. Oh, I, that feels weird. It's kind of tickling over there. I thought I lost mm-hmm. hair there. So it's like, you know that hair is coming back essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm feeling, especially at the, uh, on the on the temples of the hairline like the what would you say like the corners of the hairline feeling actually hair there especially when wind blows i can feel that effect i'm like whoa that's that's a good feeling back to sort of a sense of what i used to be and um mm-hmm. yeah no, it's it's really good and you know <laughs> you bring up the erector pili muscle and things like that and there's this there's an there's so many theoretical unproven treatments to to try doing especially even stuff like strengthening up the erecta <laughs> erecta pile muscles and all this other stuff but you know it's at the end of the day like what you're saying have the core things that we know that are proven to work 
And then anything else on top of that is like icing on the cake. That's going to sort of either help that scalp environment or um, just help increase that the uh, stimulation of, of new follicles. So, yeah, I'm mm-hmm. just I'm really excited to see sort of what happens over the next six to 12 months and see what if I'm getting any more regrowth. I think that the fact that I saw regrowth pretty much immediately means that mm-hmm. it's going to continue along this way, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what the research suggests about how the treatments yeah. work. And then there's other so, things to take into account, like synchronized shedding, right? Like a lot of people, you know, they initially get good results for like the first year and then towards a year two or, you know, the one and a half year mark, suddenly they have sometimes massive shedding. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I, I wish more people actually saw the studies regarding this because they specifically outline this occurrence. But when you start finasteride or dutasteride, you reduce a significant amount of scalp DHT. And this kind of frees up the freeze. It frees up the, I keep saying freeze. I have this like weird tongue thing, Mm -hmm. but it allows those hair follicles that were sensitive to um, DHT to kind of like start growing again, uninhibited. Right. And they kind of all do this at the same time. So they synchronize their growth cycles. And because eventually they have to shed to grow stronger hairs, they kind of do it at the same time. And it's yeah. various cycles of growth and shedding that they kind of like lose their synchronized manner. And then you kind of like stay at a point above baseline, right? So we've seen this in like the, uh, the five-year long-term studies, even the 10-year long-term studies of dutasteride and finasteride. Yeah, exactly. And I think that might be on the cards for me as well. I guess time will tell, but I just, yeah. Again, this is another thing where knowledge is power and you know when something like that's happening, it's not just because the drug's losing effectiveness. There's also, when I think about this now, there's also probably something to be said about how quickly your hair grows as well, because my hair grows really, really fast. Like Mm -hmm. just in general, if I let my hair grow out, it'll grow really quickly. And I don't know if that actually affects affects the regrowth as well or the... the Oh, no, it does. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it would. It definitely would. Like some people have hair that's just more active right? Just metabolically more active than others. Uh, that's just your genetics, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's just, it's, a, it's just interesting, especially when you see with hair transplants as well, people getting results really quickly and some people waiting as well. You can almost probably draw a correlation between people getting that quick growth, them being also probably good responders to medication as well. Then not that it'd be something that you'd be like, oh, this is guaranteed, but you know, if you're seeing quick hair growth off a transplant, uh, yeah, I mean, the medication probably works better. And you see these people as well, when they get like 1500 grafts and then they start oral finasteride and month six, it looks like they've had double that amount of grafts exactly on yeah. their on their hairline or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Then you know that's like, okay, they're a good responder and their hair grows quick. So yeah, yeah. well, hoping that happens with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. They, I don't think my results are insane or anything like that. It's I wouldn't consider myself a hyper responder. I would probably put myself maybe one standard deviation from the from like the midpoint of like a bell curve of, of responders. So I would mm-hmm. I would say I'm a good responder. Probably say I'm a good responder. Maybe maybe a great responder, but not a, not a hyper responder. I've seen some a lot more crazy stuff happen. Yeah, three months. Uh, I've seen that too on Tressless, like. Just yeah. dudes within three months getting everything back. I bet we're thinking about that same guy. There's the recent one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's funny. I, I um I think this might out me on Reddit, but I I messaged I commented on his post saying, Hey bro, can you send me a vial of your blood so I can spin it up into PRP and inject it back into myself? <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's some growth factors going on there. That's a lot of self transfer activity. Yeah, definitely. That would be hilarious. Maybe a market for him to explore, but anyways. <laughs> selling his blood. Yes. Oh, just, yeah, just selling his PRP. And like, I mean, could be even who better. knows? Maybe there is some sort of like growth factor from that, right? Like, I don't know. You think? Like, you, you isn't think Brian like, Johnson, like he takes his son's blood or something? I every does, month? yeah. Yeah, because it's it's younger. I think you probably have more platelets in, in the blood. I'm not sure how much how much you've looked into PRP, there's, uh, it's, it's pretty confusing and I've only kind of just scratched the surface. Yeah, I did a video on it. Um, 
Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at that one guy on Tressless who did his own do-it-yourself PRP. Oh, yeah, Cad did say that. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But there's obviously, I mean, that's, he's probably injecting a platelet poor plasma. Yeah. Looked at the um, quality of his PRP. Mm. It didn't look like he had that much separation between the different blood layers. Oh, that's, that's primarily a bad sign. Yeah, that's primarily, and it had like bubbles in it too. So he mm. probably just didn't have a good centrifuge or yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you could just use a washing machine if you. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> that has to be a high spin cycle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, just put on a spin cycle and no, no wash. And uh, no, I don't think that'll work. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into PRP, but I think there's there's a sweet spot where number of platelets give you the best sort of growth factors. I think if you have too many, I think sometimes it, yeah, it's like what we're saying about oral minoxidil dosage. I think it, oh, sorry, topical minoxidil dosage. I think like it is a bell curve. I don't think it becomes more effective by having yeah. more millions of platelets per milliliter or whatever it is, the unit of count. But um, yeah, I think... I'm happy to to call it here. I've been this has been really good speaking with you. I'm I'm just gonna call you Quicks. Yeah. <laughs> KWX. It's been really good speaking with you and I'm yeah, again, really appreciate it. And uh I'll be looking forward to listening to a lot all the other interviews that you have and podcasts coming up on the channel as well. I think yeah, it's gonna be really interesting and especially that one with the with the estradiol, I'm gonna I'm going to be interested in that. Does you have, is, is there a lot of photos from that one? Because I want to see some more pics. Yeah, there's there's some photos. There's like, yeah, photos in there. There's some photos in there. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Love yeah. that. And also, they, they showed me another person who posted on a public forum, and their results were pretty insane, to be honest. Oh, yeah, oh so. okay. Now, looking forward to that. But um, yeah, thanks again for having me. And um, I will be sending you some photos to put up on the screen and I'll also give you some sort of descriptions so, so you can see I'll give you some pre hair loss stuff that you can see like throughout the years how much worse it's it's become and mm -hmm. then also give you the uh the progress shots most definitely yeah that would be greatly appreciated thank you so much for you know coming here oh good man all right take it easy all right. see ya see ya bye so that's pretty much it for this podcast. I want to thank my guest for coming on and sharing a story and what he's doing to try to treat his androgenetic alopecia. So if you got this far to this part of the podcast, comment in the comments section. We made it. Yeah, pretty simple. But yeah, thank you so much. And I'm just going to include our introductory, our introductory conversation that we had. I thought it was pretty interesting. And uh, yeah, it's um, just additional content just to see how things go on behind the scenes so thanks for the support that i've been getting lately from all you guys and i hope to see you in the next video again peace out sick all right is that better yeah can you hear me yeah 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 okay i can hear you clearly yeah awesome man oh, it's good to talk to you I, it's actually pretty cool how your profile thing moves when you talk uh i have the uh i think i got the discord like plus so i have a gif as my profile picture so every, every time i talk it just moves for some reason. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. I like it. Yeah, thanks. Cool, man. Let me know when you want to get started. But um, can I call you, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Can I just call you Quix? Like KWX is fine or Quix or okay. whatever. Like, Okay, I might just say Quix because I don't know. Yeah. In, my, in my head, that's just how I, <laughs> how I know you as, so if that's all right. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. I'm planning on like a, like a name rebranding, but I never really got to it. Probably do that soon, sooner or later. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember hearing you mention that on the um on the Discord server. I think that's a good idea as well because, well, just to make it a bit more obvious what what you're sort of getting at with your content, maybe. Yeah, definitely. I have to. Uh, I don't know. I gotta think of a good name or something. At the mm. moment, I can't really think of a good one. <laughs> oh, that's alright. No, no stress. I like the um, I like your intros is like that that noise that sound you've got going on as well that's a nice that's oh yeah i'm actually a music producer too so that's one of the many things i do so i actually made that song
the oh, intro. Cool, man. No, it's yeah. really cool. Thanks. And you're also into the gym and stuff as well. Yep. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, me too. You got a good, um, your physique looks like Spider Man. It's sick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that's just from doing like pull ups over and over again, to be honest. Yeah, no, 100%. Because, um, I do. Yeah, I've done the same thing. I, I think during the COVID lockdowns, I'm not sure if you heard about what happened in, in, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in Melbourne, in Australia. I've, I've heard, uh, like there were like kind of riots or something and a lot of people were pissed. Yeah, yeah. We actually had in total, I'm not kidding, I think probably one and a half years of, of lockdowns, meaning that for about one and a half years, I wasn't allowed to leave my house. <laughs> and, um, and you know, if you had to leave your house, you could only, you could only do four things being like going for a walk, going mm -hmm. to the supermarket and going to see, um, you're only allowed to have like, x number of people in, in a household at, at one point so you couldn't actually have if you had say over four people in one household you couldn't actually have any visitors oh so, man yeah unless, unless you needed care so it was, it was a really messed up thing and then the other one is going to work so it was just really really messed up but during that time i actually did a lot of pull-ups that was the only thing i could do so i went to the park got good at doing pull-ups and yeah the back development is just really good off that yeah yeah that whole COVID era was really you know, a lot of people are isolated because of the uh, social distancing protocol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it especially bad here in um in Victoria. We only had five cases of like every day. It would be like five, four cases, but they didn't open anything. And we just had massive um, economical and I think like social uh, implications from that. So, anyways, anyways, going off topic. Do you want to? Whenever you're ready, I'm happy to start. I kind of, it's all unscripted, but I've kind of got in my head what what I want to go over. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess we kind of just, we are, you can just start as it is right now. Yes. So you can introduce yourself and like you're doing in regards to hair loss, how it's impacted you, if you're on any mm -hmm. sort of specific stack and just your overall experience when it comes to, you know, androgenetic alopecia.